This is Brian Mercer for Author Magazine, and today I'm speaking with M.J. Rose, author of The Memorist. The Memorist is a paranormal suspense novel that deals with an ancient flute that has the power to allow people to remember their past lives. It's the second in a series of four books that started with The Reincarnationalist. M.J., would you say that was, is a fair summary of your story? Was there anything you'd like to add? No, except it's The Reincarnationist. I'm sorry, The Reincarnationist, of course. So, so you're best known for your contemporary erotic thrillers. What is it that influenced you to write a paranormal suspense novel? Well, I think that I actually am not best known for that anymore. <laughs> oh, okay. I think that that was true for a while when I was writing those. But then I started writing after The Reincarnationist, which got a lot more attention than anything that I'd written before. I think that I, probably now my, most of my readers haven't, don't even know about those other books. I certainly wouldn't mind if they discovered them. Sure. But um, I've always been writing basically the same thing, which strangely enough, although they say that about all writers, I write psychological suspense, and everything that I really write about it is how our past influences who we are. And in the earlier books, that had to do with um, our recent past and our psychological past. And in these new books, we're going back further to talk about a more distant past. And, and I think that the reason that the sexual thing happened and comes up and will probably come up again is because I, I'm, I write very much from, um, by creating the characters and really getting involved in the psychology of my characters, even even though I'm writing suspense and thrillers. Sure. And what happens when you do that is you really explore the whole person. You don't just deal with the adventure that they're on, but you deal with their emotions and their feelings. And once you're exploring a whole person, you're exploring their sexuality. So if it happens and it's part of the book, then it's very much part of the book. And it seemed to be something that when I started doing it, a lot of people weren't doing. They certainly weren't doing it in suspense. Right. So I seem to have gotten a little bit of a reputation for it, which is better than the reputation I had in high school, so I'll look at it. <laughs> so, so would you say that, obviously, this genre of novel is, is heavily plot-driven, and so do you outline? No, actually, you know, I don't think I really completely belong in a genre. It's a, it's a sure. really confusing issue for me because I kind of grew up reading good books or bad books. And the books that I thought were good books were some of them had mysteries in them and some of them didn't. And I tend, I don't write to a genre. So I just write the book that I want to write. And it tends to have some suspense in it because I like reading suspense. And it tends to be very character-driven, which is not typically what you would find if you were reading in the genre mostly. My books have strong plots and strong characters, and I hope they're good books. If I have to self-identify, I certainly put myself in the suspense genre. But I have a hard time, when I talk about my writing, I have a hard time identifying it that way. That's a long way around the answer to your question, which is, I don't do heavy outlines, no, because then there would be very little discovery in the process of writing the book. What I do is I, I spend about two or three months creating a kind of a notebook for my main character that's kind of like a journal for him or her, and it's a kind of ritualistic thing I do. It has a lot to do with what I call procrastinating your way into writing a novel, <laughs> which is that I think a lot of people make the mistake of sitting down and just starting to write and writing every day and, and trying to write into the book and find the book as they write it. And a lot of people I know who do that get stuck really right. badly at about, I don't know, somewhere between 70 and 100 pages into the book where they have no idea what the book is about. So what I, when I started, when I figured all this out and I started keeping the journal, the journal allows me to explore the character for a nice long time and do all my research and make notes for him or her and figure out all this stuff about his or her life. And by the time I finish kind of creating the main characters in the book and figuring out what the big what if is and doing the research, I have a pretty strong idea of what the book's about. I know how it starts and I know how it ends. But then how it gets there, it's kind of like a journey. I like to think of it as, like, as much of a cliche as this is. It's kind of like a trip 
and I know where we're going to start, and I know we're going to go to Paris, and I just don't know what route we're going to take to get there. And so I have a 20-point outline, which is really just the big beats in the book. So-and-so gets hit over the head, so-and-so realizes that they're dead, so-and-so finds somebody right. to bring them back to life. I mean, I'm being facetious. Right, but. sure. So I, I do have that kind of outline, and it, a lot of it stays the same. A lot of it changes along the way, though. Right, right. And so, so what you're saying is you, when you start page one, you know where it's going to end up. You just Well, don't, I you, have an idea. It's I not see. very specific. I mean, I've listened to other authors talk about outlining books, and they really do know things. I, mine is, it's hard to do this with people who haven't read the book, but oh, I'll do it with another book. If it was Rebecca that I was writing, I would know that I was starting with uh, a woman who's married to a man who has a dead wife that he seems to still be in love with. And I would know at the end of the book that we would find out that probably he wasn't ever in love with that wife at all, and he probably really does like the, the new wife better, and there's probably some horrible, tragic thing that happens at the end to bring it all full, cir- full circle. And that that might be all I know. It's not it's not necessarily more specific. In the memoirist, I actually there's a scene that takes place at a concert hall at the end of the book. Right. And I knew when I started the book, within like two months of no, within less than that, probably within two weeks of coming up with the overall idea and thinking about what I wanted the story to be about, I knew that scene was going to be at the end of the book. I didn't know really what was going to happen in it. I just knew every, the book was going to culminate in this big scene, in this music hall, and that it was all going to be connected to that. I don't know. I think it's all kind of... I don't want to make too much of it and say it's a mystery, because that makes it too grand. But sure. the process is, is definitely mysterious and for me as a writer, and it definitely is... an unco- A lot of it's an unconscious process. So it sounds like even though this is... It, uh, you can... You really do see what seems to be a very intricate plot unfolding as the book goes along. But what you're saying is it's it's really character driven in, in the end. Yeah, there... it, you know, um, it, I'm hard to pin down on this. I've talked about this a lot, and it's really two things simultaneously. It's a what if, you know, what if there was an ancient flute made of bone that people supposedly that su- supposedly existed, and what if I had a woman who had childhood memories and they were torturing her and what would that make her life like? And so I really start thinking about the book. This is part of that journal. I spend two or three months just thinking about the book and making notes about it and going back and forth between the character and the story. There, you know, I think with every good book I've ever read, you can't separate the plot from the story and from the characters, I mean. Sure. If, the, if it's a good book, and I think actually Gail Lynn said this on a panel that we were on, and I think I'm going to steal it now and <laughs> say it all the time about my books too, but if the book winds up being a good book and a true book and, and the book that should have been written, then you can't imagine telling that story about another character, and you can't imagine that character living out that story in a different way, and they just simply become connected. And so I think that that's why, and she just said this on a panel I was on two weeks ago, and and it was really an eye-opener for me because it really finally described to me what it is that I'm doing and why I always have so much trouble with this question about is it character or is it plot. I think every book that you really enjoy, that you really remember, that has anything that's going to stick with you, is a combination of both, and they belong together. So it sounds like when you were talking about uh, doing this journal, that there's definitely a distinct there's distinct phases, and that was one of my questions: is when you're doing something like this book, which re- requires a little bit of historical research and research into technologies, sound technologies, that sort, and so forth. Do you find that there's a, there's set phases where you you're just doing research and doing background, and then you're trying to write the book, or are you are you even tinkering with the book while you're doing research? Both. I have, I start off by doing research first. And with this book, I read a lot of books about Vienna, a lot of books about Beethoven, a bunch of books about the Congress of Vienna in 1812. And I started writing the book about the flute. So the answer to your question is, I think that you're trying to make it into, put it into some kind of real logical progression for me. And I don't think it's a logical progression for me. You know, this is a better way to describe it. It's like making a soup. 
for a while, I'm buying all the ingredients. And I'm like wandering around to different markets and seeing what's out there and tasting some stuff and buying some stuff and not buying some other stuff. And then I come home and I put it all in the pot and I add the water and I start stirring it. And then at some point, like it takes about two to three months, I've kind of stirred it enough and I decide I'm kind of ready to start writing it. And that's about as logical or as programmatic as it gets. Well, let's talk about your, your writing regimen. A lot of people, a lot of writers say to write every day, you know, write a certain amount of pages, one page a day, that sort of thing. What, what do you do when you're, when you're doing this sort of thing? Because that's, that's one of the things that when, I, when I'm writing and I think about, you know, if I, there's something I have to do research, I'm not writing. Does, does yeah, that I research time count? Yeah, I don't, um, I don't I'm, again, I'm, I'm like a very non-rule person. So I also have a business. I have to balance it. So my day is pretty much split between those two things. I try to write for four to five hours a day. And if that means that I'm doing research, then I'm doing research. I don't, I don't have some, like, board, you know, in front of me that, or I check off, yes, wrote and did a thousand words right. a day. I try to write every day in the afternoon from like noon to six with taking a couple of breaks to walk the dog or go get some coffee or whatever I do. But the, I try to give that time to, to the novels every day. I try very hard not to work seven days a week. Very hard for me not to work every day. So I'm actually one of those people that has to force themselves not to work and take time off. I don't have a word count that I do every day. I don't have a number of pages. I just try to give every afternoon to the book. So and it's more like having time set aside for that activity rather than a certain amount of pages a day. Right, or that yeah. Sort of thing. I mean, I don't, I don't do that. I, it takes me a long time to write these books, and my publisher's been really great about moving the deadlines around. We, they wanted one a year. They moved the first one back to try to accommodate that schedule so that I would have, how do I explain this? Uh, I knew I was like a quarter of the way into the first one when I said, no way am I going to write one a year. So we moved the pub date of the first one back so that they could come out, one in September 07 and then the next in November 08. So that it, they're almost one a year, but it actually had close to three years to write because they took longer. The new one, which I'm doing now, which they want to come out with next November, is um, a little tight, and I don't know if we're going to make it. I understand the marketing reasons for trying to come out with a book every year, and I'm, I'm really trying to do it, but these books have a lot of history in them, and they're very hard to just force myself to get them done in time. I'm a, I'm a very fast, I mean, I write a really fast first draft, or I should say I write a first draft as fast as I can not very fast, but it's as fast as <laughs> right. I can write it. And I don't, I try not to dwell on the sentences and anything too much while I'm doing that. I don't reread as much as I should, as much as other authors do when they're writing their first draft. And I try to get through the first draft, which I guess is the hardest part for me of a book. And then when I'm done with that, I, then I love rewriting. I start rewriting and I rewrite as long as I can. I could rewrite for seven years and still not be happy. So it's like you like to shape and to edit almost more than, because you have something to work with rather than starting from a blank page. And yeah, yeah. I, I, I really need to force myself through those, that first draft. But it's not that the blank page scares me. It's just the, oh, my God, where am I going? Where am I going? These books are so complicated for me more than the books that I wrote before so I think that's how I do it yeah it seems easier to, to, to shape something when it's when you have something to work with yeah. so often as writers we have you know some form of autobiography that slips into our story and it might be even every story would you would you say that would be the case with your the memorist is there any part of it I'm, no <laughs> so, no so I don't I really don't write about myself. I'm, I think that would be incredibly boring. So I'm not a character in my own book. I think that there's some of my psychology is probably in all the books, and it's probably the same thing that's in all the books. I mean, it's the same character flaw or psychological problem I have that's in all the books, but I don't know what it is. No. Sure. So let's talk a little bit about, and this is a lot of our readers are aspiring writers themselves. And I wanted to, you to talk a little bit about lip service and how that took off, because it's such a really interesting story. 
Okay, so what happened was I had an agent, and which I think is a really important thing for every writer to do, is to get an agent. I firmly believe if you can't get an agent, there's something wrong with the book, because an agent's entire uh, livelihood is based on selling books, and so they are always looking for new ones. I mean, maybe there are half a dozen agents that won't take new clients, but then they usually have uh, someone else in the agency who does. So I had a really good agent, and she had taken out my first novel and gotten a lot of excitement for it from a lot of editors who felt that they were really interested, but my book crossed too many genres and they didn't know how to market it. So my agent asked me if I would write another book and try to, to keep it a little bit more in one genre, which obviously plays back to the beginning of our conversation. So I tried to write another book that I thought was a little bit more of one genre, but when she took that one out, the same thing happened. And they said it's too literary to be commercial, it's too commercial to be literary. It's too much of a mystery to not be a mystery, but it's not enough of a mystery to be a mystery. It's too erotic not to be erotica, but it's not erotic enough to be erotica. So they didn't know how to market me, and she said, I think you should write a third book. And we're now like two and a half, three years into this thing, and I've been writing and trying to get an agent for five years before that. So I'm like eight years into this process, and I'm like, okay. And I went away and started writing a new book, and then I felt like a, this is ridiculous. I knew that that was how I wrote. And I knew I was not going to be able to force a book into a genre. And if I was, then I decided I'd rather stay in advertising, where I had to write to market anyway. If I was going to write books, I wanted to write the books I wanted to write, not the ones that fit somebody's preconceived notions of where it fit in on some shelf. I said to her, um, I had been doing research on the Internet, and uh, like a year went by where I didn't really write the third book, and I didn't really contact her, and then some stuff happened in my life. And... By 1998, I wrote her and I said, you know, I'm going to do this thing. I, I know a lot about the Internet now. Nobody, she didn't. Not many people did in, in the beginning of 98. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to put this book out there as a, as a download and I'm going to market it. I'm going to test market it because I knew how to do that. I was the creative director of a $150 million ad agency. And I'm going to test market the book on a very small scale and get you information about how to market this book and what kind of marketing would work. And then you can go back to these publishers and you can say, here, she did her own marketing. This is how you market this book. So it was really just an, an, an effort and an experiment to figure out what marketing would sell this book best. I was not trying to self-publish my book. I wasn't trying to break through that way. I wasn't trying to circumvent the system. I was simply doing market research to go back and give the publisher. So I did it in the beginning in, in June. I started in June of 98. And by the fall of 98, the book, I wound up having to print up copies, too, because a lot of people didn't want to download it. So I published some ARCs. I, I thought of them as ARCs. I made some ARCs, and I did this whole process. And I was getting all the information to give her to go back to the publishers when the book actually got discovered by the people at the Doubleday Book Club and the Literary Guild who found it and read it and asked me if they could buy it for the book clubs. And I said, sure, and I sold it to them and went back to the agent and said, I just sold the book to the book club. Do you want to sell it to a publisher now? And she was, like, screaming on the phone, oh, my God, this has never happened. It's never happened. So I said, really, it's never happened. So if it's never happened, I made a press release up, and I called Bloomberg, and I contacted all these places, and it made a ton of news because it was right at the time. Nobody had done anything like this before. It was pre-Stephen King. Stephen King going online with a free ebook. It was pre Seth Godin unleashing the idea virus. There wasn't anybody doing anything online with books in any kind of serious way. So the book got discovered and then it got picked up and Pocket Books bought it and the Double Day Book Club did it and I was on the Today Show and I was on the Jim Lair Hour and it was all exciting, exciting, exciting. And that's what happened. And, and my friend likes to say that I became a Russian princess on the eve of the revolution. Because no sooner did I get published than I learned that publishers, who are all wonderful people and I love them all very much, don't have the time or energy to devote to market to marketing 85% of the books that they publish. And they don't come out of advertising. They come out of PR, most of them, or they come out of publishing. So they're still kind of caught up in the way of doing things, which isn't the way that I learned how to do them. That's great. And, and so it sounds like that the... The internet back then was a completely different environment. So it's this is not something 
you would recommend this is not a recommended way you would go for people who are trying to break into print well yes and no I mean it's different with fiction and nonfiction with nonfiction and if you have a niche book that that's aimed at, at a group of people a specific group of people and there aren't any publishers that want the book because they think that the group of people the book is aimed at is too small I think it's a perfect way to do things and um, even with a nonfiction book, if you're the right person, I think it's a great way to do things. I mean, Seth Godin did Unleashing the Idea Virus. The right person can absolutely do this online still today with nonfiction. You just have to know that it's going to be a lot of marketing effort and it's going to be a lot of money. With fiction, the problem is people don't need fiction. They do need nonfiction. They need to know about the diet that's going to help them lose weight in their feet only or you know they uh, breastfeeding truck drivers need a book about how to be a better breastfeeding truck driver there still are people need those books nobody needs fiction i mean they might need it as a concept they might need to read they don't need one book over another generally so most people who read fiction don't go to google and type in new novel they go to a bookstore and they browse or they browse they write a book that they liked into the Amazon search engine, look what other people are buying like that. But people who buy fiction tend to buy more by genre and by um, author. And so the problem is, if you self-publish fiction, you can't get into bookstores. You can get into the Amazon or the Barnes & Noble database, but you're not going to come up in any searches because you're not going to have any co-op. You're not going to have enough books sold. There are a whole lot of things you're not going to have. To break into publishing through self-publishing fiction is much harder than it ever was. There are, I don't know, 50,000 people doing it a year, and maybe one or two are breaking out. You can still do what I did, and people are doing it every year, where the goal is, I'm going to self-publish this book and market it and get 2,000 copies sold, and then I'm going to go to a publisher. But the overall caveat goes back to, if you can't get an agent to take your novel, if there isn't an agent out there that believes enough in the novel to take you on, there's something wrong with the novel. And the problem with what everybody is doing in, non in fiction is there are so many writers who are saying, I wrote a book, I don't need it to be vetted, I know it's great, my aunt says it's great, I'm going to publish it. And that's not what I did, and that's not what the people who have worked, who this system has worked for have done. You need to be edited, you need professional book covers, you need a professional copy editor. You need all the things that you can either pay a lot of money for yourself or you can get from a publisher. But it's not just getting a book out there, and it's not just doing blog ads. The consumer can tell. The reader knows. And the reader can go to your Amazon page, and the reader doesn't even know why, but they can sense that this isn't a traditional book, and it's very hard to break through. Right. You, know, you write their first novel, and when we're done, we generally think, oh, this is, we're really enthused about it. This is great. We, you know, we love it. And then we try to get it published, and you know, off, more off times than not, it doesn't get published. So then we might write a second novel and a third novel, and then you know, with time and perspective and experience, we realize, well, maybe that first novel wasn't as good as I thought it was. Right. But I didn't know that at the time. So if someone's written their first novel and they're really enthused about it, you're saying vet it through an agent. But yeah. Yeah, I'm, that's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, my first three novels will never be published. But the Internet, as fabulous as it is, has created this kind of DIY, which is great, attitude that people seem to think precludes actually doing the work. So I get all these, I, I get a lot of authors who write me letters and say things like, I, ha I tried to get an agent, two people rejected me. So I don't need them. They don't know what they're talking about. I'm going to self-publish this book. And, and I'm like, don't do it. And I really, I, I really tr try to talk people out of it. A lot of people don't care, and they don't listen to me, which I don't blame them. Who am I? And they do it, and you never hear from them again. And then every once in a while, somebody will do it, like the woman who wrote The Lace Reader. And they did exactly what I did, which was they self-published it, and they tried to market it in one area of the country which is the Boston-Salem area, because that's where the book took place. And they did, and they got, and they sold 2,000 books, and they got an agent, and they sold it to HarperCollins for a lot of money. It was terrific success. But you have to know it, they had it professionally edited, a professional book cover, all kinds of things. There, there was no question 
that it was done, you couldn't tell that it was a self-published book. The the book ultimately lip service that got published on yeah. online and that was picked up by Pocket Books and Doubleday was that was that was not your first novel, is what you're saying? You'd written no, it wasn't the first that. novel that I ever wrote. Um, it was the fir- it was and it wasn't the first novel. It wasn't the novel that the agent took me from. The the novel that um, my first novel that I got an agent with was published as my third novel, and it was rewritten a little bit, even a lot actually. And it was called Flesh Tones, and Flesh Tones was published as my third novel, but it was. The first book I got an agent with, Lip Service, was the second book that I wrote once I had an agent. And the okay. books that I wrote before Lip Service, the three books, won't ever be published because they're atrocious. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was learning how to write. And and how did you find your agent? Um, I'm very impatient, and I was a business person. So what I did was I found somebody who kind of brokered agents. You, what she, she did was she read my book. And she came up with a list of agents that she thought would be interested in it. She was an ex-editor at Dub from Doubleday. She knew everybody in the business. And I, and I, and the deal was that I gave her seven um, percent of the book for the, for the life of the book. Um, if I got an agent and I got a sale, she got seven percent of the book, which now it's a lot of money just to help someone get right. an agent. Um, now I think if there are people that do it, they probably do it on a flat fee. But I really didn't want to go through the rigmarole of writing 90 million people letters. I was like, I was in advertising. I didn't. I was too much of a business person to do it that way. I don't mean that it's. I don't mean business like and that the the way everybody's supposed to do it is wrong. I just meant I was a New Yorker in a hurry. So <laughs> she found. Um, she put together a list of five people. I looked at what they had carried. And there were two people, we went to two people first, well, went to one person first, who was willing to take me on if I changed the end of the book, and I wasn't, the second person that we went to, and she was my agent for um, many of my novels. This is not a, the standard way, to which one? No, I, I don't, most people don't have to do this. I mean, most people, if it's a good book, most people will get an agent, and the agent will be able to sell it. And if they can't sell it, I really think most of the time there's something wrong with the book or you're not, it's not time yet. It's not the right time for the book. But sure. I just should warn everybody that, you know, doing this is a process that's going to take six months to a year out of their life when they could, if they have a good agent, I would just say, don't, remember, I didn't do this with the first novel she took. I didn't, I did it when she said, write a third novel. And the problem was that there was a marketing problem. It wasn't a book problem. And it was right. a different time, you know, when genres were a little bit more specific. But if, an, if I had an agent now and she said, everybody loved your first book and they want to see a second book, I wouldn't say, I'm going to go self-publish my first book. I would write the second book for the agent. And then if the agent said, everybody loves the second book and the reason that they're not buying either book is the characters aren't strong enough or the plot's not quite there, I'd write a third book. The only reason I did it was because it was a marketing problem, and I was convinced I had a marketing solution. So what advice would you give aspiring authors who are looking to get in, into publishing? Just keep writing. Just You know, I think one of the problems is, um, and I, I went through this, and everybody I know goes through this, and it's hard to, for somebody who's there to, to hear this the way that it's intended, but... The best part about this is writing, not getting published. I mean, if you're a writer, it's because you really want to write, and the writing is what's wonderful. I get awesome. more pleasure out of writing, and I feel more fulfilled, and it keeps me sane, and, and, and it is what I do. The writing is what I do, not the being published. Writing is an art, and publishing is a business, and it's a broken business. And you have to do this for the art and for the love of the writing, first and foremost, and 90% of the time. The publishing is always going to disappoint you. I mean, there are probably five authors a year who are the it authors, who've written the it book, who nothing is disappointing about the process. But even those people, and a lot of them are my friends, they number four on the New York Times bestseller list, and I talk to them, and how are you? And it's like, I need to be number two. And it's like, it's not about, it's so you get caught up in all the wrong things. I would keep your day job because you love writing. I have a day job because 
I don't want to write something I don't love. And and I came through that the hard way. I, I started writing. I had a day job. Then at a certain point I quit, and I was just writing, and I saw what it was doing to my writing. It, it was about getting published. It was about writing something that was going to sell well. That's not what I wanted to do, so I started a business so I could go back to writing what I wanted to write. So I think if I have one piece of advice, it's to be realistic about the business and do this for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons, because only like, I don't know, 2% of people, it's probably not, probably only 10 or 15% of write, of fiction writers make a living at it. The rest of the people have to do something else. So I just think you just really have to love doing this. Thank you.